Hello and happy Tuesday, April 14th. It is a lovely day on Cortez Island in British Columbia. Welcome to our first weekly episode of Gabbing About Gardening. I'm your host, Lucretia Shanfarber. And that lovely little snippet of music we are just listening to, that is Compliments of Willow the all-woman band from Quadra Island, and that is called C Minor. Willow's made up of four lovely women from Quadra Island. That's Andrea, Trinity, Maureen, and Noel. Thank you for that wonderful music, ladies. On Gabbing About Gardening, we'll be talking about the regenerative practices that will heal our garden planet. And today, I realized, is my 50th gardening anniversary. Yes, I actually started my own first garden 50 years ago today in a little place called Udashenya, near Castlegar in the West Kootenai region of British Columbia. I was only 18 years old. I was nine months pregnant with my first child. And my son, Justice, was born two days later on April 15th. Happy birthday, Justice. And one thing I know for sure is that 50 years of off and on gardening does not make me an expert in any way. I'm much more of an experimenter than an expert, but I do love to gab with experts and experimenters about gardening, about composting, about soil health, anything to do with gardening. So on today's show, we'll start off gabbing about a burning issue. In fact, it is about burning and our seasonal habit of burning the branches and prunings from our yards and gardens. And as much as we all love a bonfire, is burning really a good idea? What about the air pollutants and the CO2 we're releasing into our already sickened atmosphere? Can we make better use of that woody resource while building soil fertility? Arzina Hamir from the Comox Valley Regional District and Dr. Lee Gass from North Quadra Island think it's time to rethink and repurpose our woody debris. They'll give us some great ideas on burning alternatives that are better for us, for our neighbors, and for our garden planet. Then we'll gab with Melissa Rickey a gardening professional on Cortez Island who's absolutely passionate about compost, bokashi compost, this traditional Korean approach to making fast, biologically active compost might be just the thing you need to up your compost game. And then we'll make a call to Australia, where Morag Gamble, the permaculture mama, will tell us about Perma Youth and how it has dramatically changed the lives of Kenyan refugees who now grow their own food and tend their own permaculture gardens. That's what's happening today on Gabbing About Gardening. So let's get this party started. Arzine Hamir is, well, she does so many jobs. How about we just ask her to tell us about herself? Hi, Arzina. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for joining us. It's a really special occasion to have you. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I, I don't refuse a, um, an invitation to chat with you about gardening anytime. So. Oh, thank you. So how yeah. do you identify today? You're a, a, a <laughs> Renaissance woman. You're a teacher, an organic farmer, an agronomist, a food security activist, a politician, a mama. Uh, you're the co-owner and co-founder of Amara Organic Foods. How are you showing up here now? Uh, I uh, am the chief pea transplanter, I think, so because that's what's currently like dirt under my nails and my knees are a bit sore. So that's how I'm identifying today. Well, that's a great way to to uh, identify. I think we all need to get dirty. How is the springtime burning situation going in the Comox Valley? It's 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 a, such a regular thing this time of the year. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, first of all, I just want to point out when we first arrived at our farm, um, 10 years ago, um, that is just something that people did when they were clearing land. They, they burned all the woody debris. Um, it was just easy and fast. Um, but we know better. 
and um, there are other options now. So, um, you know, at our own farm, we have purchased a chipper because, um, you know, my father-in-law has lung issues, and I have to say last year in 2020, um, there was a fire ban across the province of British Columbia, and people really noticed the difference in the air quality. And that fire ban was partly because of COVID, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, the thought was that, you know, COVID is a respiratory, primarily respiratory disease, and adding particulates in the air on top of that would um, potentially make the problem even worse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was put in place as a public health order, as much as, you know, reducing our risk for fires in the summertime as well. So, it was just instituted, and um, now that that ban is not in place, I am seeing um, such a big increase in complaints around people starting up that practice of burning oh, again. Oh, that's so interesting. That's, you know, why I really want to talk about alternatives to burning because um, they are there, and people maybe don't realize, and um, they also maybe don't realize that you know that that fire smell that I think we're all kind of attracted to in some ways is actually harmful for our bodies. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of, uh, of stuff that goes into the air when you burn that can be absorbed not only into your lungs, but into your bloodstream. Well, I know we're getting, uh, yeah. uh, in our family, much more sensitive, much more aware. And like you, I do hear people talking about it a lot more, feeling concerned, looking mm-hmm. for alternatives. Let's let's just uh, do a quick recap of what are the existing rules and regulations regarding burning right now? Um, well, it depends, really depends where you live. So this is part of the confusion. Um, if you are living in a municipality, um, as of April 1st, there is no backyard burning allowed without a permit from a fire, um, district, from your fire, local fire district. And then in the regional districts or in the more rural areas, um, it really depends. So that's something that you should contact your local um, government just Mm -hmm. to double check if you are wanting to burn then you need to know the rules always check before you burn but ideally start thinking about not burning Uh, what are people burning i mean i i was i was watching on facebook on um well on the gabbing about gardening facebook page actually and people were quite upset. Their neighbors were going as far as not only burning their backyard prunings and their winter windfall, they were throwing a a, a bunch of garbage in there. And, and yeah. it was not fun for the neighbors. No, no. And, you know, it's bad enough having, like, carbon going up into the atmosphere. We're, we're at a time in, in the planet's life cycle that we just do not need any more of that carbon there. But on top of that, to be burning garbage that could contain plastics, then you're starting to, you know, put in all kinds of chemicals that are carcinogenic in, into the atmosphere. So such a bad practice. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, it's something that really needs to stop. So there are alternatives and, and, you know, this is why I'm hoping that we can chat about that because, Absolutely. um, for, you know, for one, when you're a gardener, and, you know, you're, we're learning so much more about how important it is to feed the soil. Um, soil organisms love and need carbon. And so you've gone through all of that effort to grow your plants, to grow the woody perennials, and then you're just going to release that carbon up into the air? No, mm. let's capture it and put it back in the soil. So a really easy way to do that if you have access to a chipper um, that's what we finally invested in. And so now we chip everything and it creates this beautiful mulch that we put around our raspberries, around the base of our fruit trees. So it's a fantastic infusion of carbon, but mulch also helps reduce weeds. It helps conserve water. So many benefits to having a woody mulch material on the soil. Oh, I'm a big wood chip fan. And, yeah. you know, I love that message of yours, Arzina. Capture that carbon and put it back into the soil yeah. via wood chips. Now, we do have a wood chipping program, the complements of the SRD. Unfortunately, we are not allowed to keep our wood chips. Mm-hmm. They haul them off island. I but, know. you know, in a recent Discovery Islander article, uh, Jim Abram was reporting that he 
is really promoting the idea of finding a way for us to keep our wood chips. Were you yeah. in on those conversations? I was, yeah. Mm, and we've written letters to the province to provide some more flexibility to that program so the wood chips can stay in the community. That's so, fingers fabulous. Crossed, yeah, that Do you think that might project, happen this year yeah. or is it something that's mm-hmm. going to take time? I think it's going to take time. Mm-hmm. I think the current round of funding has already been established for that chipping program for 2021. So my hope is for 2022. Well, that's our hope too. And yeah. I know that Whitney Vanderleesen, just a quick shout out to Whitney and partner Jordan here on Cortez Island, having their baby Farley, a little baby girl. Oh. Whitney has been very vocal, written many letters, hoping to shift things. Thank you for your help on moving that initiative forward we've you know I, I i think the more people who voice their desire to keep the wood chips local yeah. and find a safe and renewable way to utilize them mm-hmm. uh, I, you know that's that's what we want that's what every every gardener wants so i, I think we're going to move in that direction do you have any other tips about how to you know reduce our dependency on these um regular fires and yeah, other ways yeah. to use wood? Sure. So, you know, if you don't have access to a chipper that can turn your your trimmings and your prunings into small pieces, um, there is a practice called hugo culture where you actually bury those, um, those you know, prunings, um, and they can be quite large. Like, they don't have to be skinny little things. Um, you can put in quite large rounds of wood. You bury that into the soil and allow the soil to decompose that woody material. Um, and the, the, the decomposing wood then acts as a sponge and helps to trap moisture, helps to f- eventually feed the soil so that whatever you plant on top is able to then take advantage of it, all of those nutrients that are being released as the wood decomposes. So look up Hugel culture. It's spelled H-U-G-E-L, Hugel culture. Um, it's a practice that um, is readily used across the world and, you know, different styles and different um, systems. An easy way is just creating mounds. Um, you know, first of all, digging a trench, putting that woody material down. Um, if you have access to manure, that will help stimulate the breakdown of the wood. Um, put some manure down or some kind of nitrogen source, urine, um, whatever, even grass clippings, and then you cover that woody material with more soil. So you're almost creating a raised bed. In fact, you are. You're creating a raised bed, um, and then you can plant into the soil on top. That is a fantastic way of very slowly releasing the carbon. You're doing so much for feeding the soil. And it's a great way of actually starting a brand new garden bed. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something that you've done before at your garden. I've seen that happen too. Well, first of all, that is one of the most fabulous descriptions of Google culture I've heard, Arsina, that it really gives a a visual impression. And in a few minutes, we'll have Lee Gass, a guy who's done a lot of hoogling. In fact, like you say, in my own garden, on Quadra Island, uh, more than half of our garden was built up using the concept of hoogles because we had such a, a wet, swampy zone. Yeah. We needed to lift things up. We had all this wood around, and you know we did not want to burn it. This has been a, an, an ongoing discussion with my husband, Lee, for many years. I am thoroughly convinced now that we don't have to burn anymore. It took a while to convince me. But I'm thrilled with the fertility of those hugo beds. That's fantastic to hear. Um, you know, I think we, uh, maybe it's just that we grow up around trees and we're maybe used to having all this woody debris and there's just so much of it. And, oh, you know, it doesn't matter if we burn. Um, it's so great to hear that you're taking advantage. There are so many nutrients that are embedded in woody material that um, can help the garden. So I'm really glad to hear that. Yes. Well, thanks for that encouragement. And I know a lot of people uh, on Quadra Island, Cortez Island, actually all over the world, we're going to be speaking with uh, Australian permaculturist, uh, 
uh, Morag Gamble. Mm. And in Australia, they are building more hugel beds, less and less burning. Of course, they have a huge problem with, with fires burning out of control there. So I imagine that hugels are a very important part of gardeners all around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I have one last tip or, you know, an idea for folks um, to use their woody prunings, especially if you have um, things like currants, um, gooseberries, uh, where you can actually root the cuttings and share in your garden sort of bounty with other gardeners. So instead of burning all of that material, um, just planting, you literally just have to put, plant a stick in the ground, in, in a pot, in a one gallon pot. It roots really, really easily. And then, you know, these are great presents for your friends and your neighbors. So the, another way of just propagating and uh, promoting gardening uh, in your neighborhood. Love it. Don't burn it. Propagate it. Make more of those and pass them along to all of your friends. Trade them. Well, I know that when I pruned my gumi berry bush, I think mm -hmm. um, I, I I got one of those to you last year. I hope it's doing well. Uh, oh, it is. Yeah. I good. see it budding. Yeah. Good. The Eleagnus multiflora, uh, I can just stick that down in the in the earth and have a new tree within a year. And you're saying the same with gooseberries? What other gooseberries plants? And any of the currants do that. I actually have um, black elderberry, and it multiplies like that so easily. So I have stuck another 40 in pots that I'm going to be planting. It's a really easy way to, to propagate. So there are many perennials that need to be pruned, but whose prunings can also be rooted. So... Yeah, um, lots of demand for all of those. So you could even sell them if you wanted to. But, you know, giving them away as presents is, is super nice as well. It is. It's always lovely to give a plant. And I just love your perspective, Arzina. And I'm sure we'll be calling on you many times over the course of this new radio show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you for inviting me anytime. I'd love to chat. Thanks, Arzina. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. Okay. I'm Lou. This is Gabbing About Gardening. A shout out to our sponsor from bdbin.ca. Give Joyce a call or check out her website. I love the Speedy Bin composting bins. They are rat proof, they are raccoon proof, and they really do speed up your composting. Thank you so much, Joyce, for being one of our sponsors on Gabbing About Gardening. Also a shout out to Campbell River Garden Club. Quadra Island Garden Club and the Cortez Island Garden Clubs. Coming up next is the guy who convinced me to stop burning and start hoogling, and it was not easy. It took a lot of patience on his part because, like most people, I loved my springtime bonfire. This guy is Lee Gass, an award-winning UBC science prof, now retired, who is now a full-time sculptor and writer. Lee is also my husband and land managing partner, and we're going to get Lee on the phone and hear from him. Let's start by you telling us about your experience of convincing me to stop burning. As I recall, it was not that easy to do. Well, I think it, it helps to step back and just realize we live in a forest here. Uh, our property is eight and a half acres. It is about half forest. Uh, and we're not in a fire protection region. And we're near a provincial park where people have campgrounds, camp fires. And so fire is an important issue here. Um, so is nutrient for the garden. And the, the pattern in this little valley where we live, is people have burn piles. We had burn piles. We had a couple of them every year, big burn piles. Uh, and they produce a lot of heat and a lot of smoke. Um, and it burns up the wood. So I've been, for the last five years or so, I've been uh, experimenting with ways to not have burn piles. 
uh, and at first I just started breaking up uh, uh, branches that fall down, trees that fall down, anything that's too small to use for firewood, breaking it up, putting it in a low place, and stomping it down in to make sure it's in contact with the ground, and just watching it over a period of years. And it, it goes pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just two or three years ago, started getting serious about harvesting woody material from the forest and moving it into what I think of as Lou's compost factory. But this is woody material. And I've been building berms down in the low part, the wet, moist part of the property that we can't use anyway, uh, at the edge anyway, and putting that stuff down there, moving several trailer loads. Last last uh, year it was seven full trailer loads of stuff down there, arranging it so that it stays moist and is contact, in contact with the ground. And the plan is to move that material as it decomposes, move, move it into the nether part of Lou's compost garden or compost factory. Uh, and once it gets in there, it goes much faster, and she moves it, you move it, into the various aspects of your compost producing well, right. factory. That's what it is. It is a factory, isn't it? And 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 things reduce in size. Um, it's it's a little labor intensive, but I I think it keeps you healthy and strong to do that kind of physical labor. What do you think? Well, you got to do something. <laughs> um, and it isn't. You know, it is. It is work. It's a lot. Well, it is more work than having a bar, a burn pile. Well, work but is the good for part us. Of a, having a burn pile is getting the stuff to where the burn pile is and getting it stacked into the right kind of burn pile that can have lots of oxygen so it has less smoke and less particulate matter and less, you know, partially burned hydrocarbons, um, poisons. Um, that's a lot of work, too. It is a lot of work. And, you know, all you're left with is a, a pile of ash, which, you know, it, it has some value, but nothing like the carbon that you and our Zena are both encouraging us to take advantage of rather than burning up in, in a short period of time, letting it decompose over a longer period of time, bringing it back into the garden, or just planting over top of it. Tell us about the, the hoogles you've made in the, in the food forest garden and, okay. and how so they're when we first producing. Here, when was that? 17 years ago? 18? Yeah. Uh, There'd never been a garden here before. And it's a south-facing slope, but it is a slope. Uh, It slopes on the slant from corner to corner of the garden. So that meant if we didn't want all the water to run downhill, that we had to have terraces of some kind that went across the hill. And because there was a lot of stuff around here, like big pieces of logs and not big pieces of logs, but pieces of logs, etc. Uh, we learned about hoogles, and so those terraces are hoogles, and it's really worked well in it that really part has. of the garden. Yeah, we've got uh, roses, raspberries there, lilies, uh, all kinds of of wonderful plants are are doing extremely well there. Let me ask you this question though, Lee: Is there a fire hazard associated with hugels as they are decomposing, and how do you reduce that risk or eliminate it altogether? Well, I mean the secret. It's not a secret either. I shout it. <laughs> uh, the secret of what I'm doing is to keep the stuff moist. And if it's in small enough pieces, this is key, if it's in small enough key pieces that it's in contact with the ground all the time, then it goes fast. And especially if it's in contact with moist ground. It helps to have moist ground if there's more of it. 
more pile. The weight of it pushes down, and it's important to stomp it. I stomp it when I put it in, and it compacts a lot. What that does, it doesn't take the air out of the pile. It takes some of the air out of the pile, but what it does is it gets those small pieces closer together. Mm -hmm. They touch each other more. If they touch each more, each other more, fungi and bacteria and all, uh, small creatures can crawl from piece to piece to piece to piece, and it goes faster. I've noticed a lot of bird life coming out of that area as well. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, and snakes like to go in there, and they like to go in there for good reason. Yes, they do, and we love those snakes. They help keep down the, the slug population. Last year, we lost our favorite contorted yeah. willow, and it's laying down there, and, and we were just discussing um, the possibility of actually just laying those willows down yeah. on their side in the moist area and letting them sprout up as a hedgerow. Are you still yeah. feeling pretty good about that idea? Oh, yeah. I mean, since we talked about it, I've been imagining the best way to do it and, you know, things like that. Um, you know, maybe trim all the branches off one side but not the other side and, you know, things like that. It, but it's time we can do that next week, maybe. Yeah, I'll be up for it. We've got a long stretch of good weather coming up, actually even hot weather getting up into the 20s. So that's an ideal thing to do. Thank you so much for this, Lee. It's a wonderful reminder to keep it moist, stomp it down, use it, don't burn it. It's going to make great soil and save the atmosphere. I hope we'll chat again, Lee. <laughs> See you when I get home. <laughs> yep. Thanks for your help. You're welcome. That is Lee Gass from Quatra Island telling us about some of his methods of not burning, but using that and building hugo beds, hugo culture. We'll have more about gardening, more about composting. Our next guest is going to be Melissa Ricky, and she's going to talk about bokashi composting. For now, we're back to the beautiful, beautiful sounds of Willow and a lovely piece called Carry On.
Hello again and welcome back to Gabbing About Gardening. I'm Lou. This is CKTZ 89.5 Cortez Radio FM. Thanks for joining us today. Our next guest on Gabbing About Gardening is a professional gardener on Cortez Island. Melissa Rickey is a Bokashi compost enthusiast. And if you don't know... (laughs) What Bakashi is, just stick around. We're going to find out so much more together with Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, So before we get focused on the nitty-gritty of Bakashi-style composting, let's uh, just tell me a little bit about what's going on in your garden on Cortez Island. We we have some beautiful weather. What's popping up in your garden? (laughs) Well, I was just saying to my partner yesterday that I'm really just so thrilled with my garden. It's year four for my garden, and it's finally sort of acting like a mature garden. Like it's the beds are getting nicely settled into where they are. Um, we're ha- I'm having beautiful volunteers of a lot of medicinals and, and um, plants that I've planted for uh, ben- to attract beneficial insects, and lot- all these beautiful volunteers are-, are now coming up for plants that I invited in and brought in, and, and they're getting really well established. I planted carrots yesterday. Uh, on the weekend, I planted some beautiful um, little seedlings of Chinese cabbage and bok choy and um, lettuce and broccoli. <laughs> I'm trying nice. to grow radishes, mm. which... Uh, yeah, they uh they're they're my challenge crop radishes of all things, which I find kind of amusing. Oh, it is, but they like a very certain kind of soil. What kind of soil do you actually have? Well, I have mostly clay soil. I'm mm-hmm. I'm definitely finding the one area on our property where I can sort of mine a little bit of sandy soil for these radishes cuz uh they they're not liking my clay and I guess I've I've probably also I've also tried um well, because I'm getting so many beautiful worm castings <laughs> um, from my worm bins, and I got some really beautiful cow manure from Linnea Farm last year that's composted for a whole year, plus all the seaweed that I'm putting on my garden and all of the sort of no-till experiments that I'm doing. I've just got so many areas that are getting to be quite fertile and the clay soil is is changing. The, the I'm getting a beautiful layer of organic on the surface. So a lot of the areas where I usually um, want to go plant things, I, I can't plant radishes there because they're too fertile. <laughs> it's always so something. mostly clay. We always have. have some sort of vegetable nemesis. I I, I find that um, just eludes us, and, yeah. and other people can grow so easily. So <laughs> congratulations on year four. Congratulations on stockpiling all those resources and transforming your garden into a fertile place for flowers and vegetables and berries. Thank you. What we really want to hear and learn about is Bakashi. How did you learn about Bakashi? It, (laughs) It seems to be hitting center stage, but up until recently, nobody really heard about it. How, how did you learn about Bakashi? Well, it was a year ago when I was getting quite frustrated with my clay soil. And, um, and I had, I had gotten this beautiful cow manure from Linnea Farm, but I knew I had to leave it to compost for a year and, um, and just didn't have, didn't, didn't have all the, all the, didn't have a nice big compost pile that I had, that I had been, um, turning and, and working on. Um, I was sort of sorting out in, in my new place, um, like how, how to just organize my systems because I didn't want to have kitchen waste in my big compost pile. So I was just evolving my systems basically and, and really, uh, because of, of, um, not having them set up in a way that was satisfactory. They weren't really working for me. I had a shortage of organic material to put on my garden. I really needed more compost, and I was in a hurry for something sort of accelerated. And I stumbled upon this uh, so, some great video resources on YouTube about 
building a worm bin. So I set, a, set about building a worm bin and uh, went down to um, Raincoast Farms in the Merville area to buy my red wiggler worms from a guy named Ian Graham. And he just, he ha- taught me all about, all about um, Bokashi. He, he's been doing some education on Vancouver Island for a couple of years. And um, when he also sells beautiful plants, um, strawberries and tomatoes, mostly. Um, and whenever you buy something from Ian, you get to go home with this a bottle of this beautiful, what he calls a probiotic um, mother culture, and which is a sometimes called lactic acid bacteria in the Korean natural farming uh, terminology, and which I, I had never heard of Korean natural farming until I until I talked to Ian, and um, yeah, but my brain just exploded with all this mm-hmm. stuff that he was telling me about. So this. This mother culture is used for many things, but one of the things it's used for is primarily lactic acid bacteria. And um, what, it's, what it's used for in Bokashi is, Bokashi is a way of fermenting your kitchen waste. Um, and it, it, um, it accelerates its breakdown. Um, and is a... Is a Okay, so yeah, I get really scattered when I start when I well, start talking you know, about it. You, so. you don't sound scatter, scattered at all from from my perspective. I'm I'm making notes and following along as I'm sure a lot of people are. But as soon as you said ferment, you know, everything went ding 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 because that's such a catchword. But who thinks about fermenting kitchen waste? Is it is it along the same principles as as kimchi and sauerkraut and making yogurt and except you do it. With compost, is it like feeding the guts of the soil? Then, like totally, okay. totally, it's okay, like probiotics it. for your for your garden, and it's it's the same kind of process as what happens when we're making sauerkraut. So it's it's an anaerobic process that um, that utilizes primarily the the lactic acid bacteria to to do to do the breakdown. I love it. Probiotics for your garden. So uh-huh. you you learned how to do it. You got this mother culture from Ian Graham at Raincoast Farms. What was the next step? What did you do when you got home with this stuff? Well, um, the next step with it, well, first I multiplied it because I knew I wanted to use it. As The more I learned about it, I wanted to use it in many applications. So to, to multiply it, um, the I added the mother to water and molasses in uh, certain quantities and then that cultures for for two weeks and so i ended up from his one liter you know making probably 20 liters so that i'd have lots to to do lots of experiments and things with but but the other thing i did immediately was to use some of it to well one of those um I call it activated. So when when you take a, a mother culture that's that's ready, that's been fermented for a couple of weeks, and you add it to water and and molasses, it it's it sort of activates it again. And at that stage, you can use it to you can put it on amendments like alfalfa pellets or manure. You can pour it on those to get them more ready for your garden. Um, or you, you can also make Bokashi bran, which is the main thing that you need to do this form of composting. To make Bokashi bran, you take the activated mother culture, you add it to bran. And it's funny, I didn't have bran, and I was so eager to get started, I thought, well, I'm going to use a different sort of carbon substrate. So I went and got some maple leaves, and I used maple leaves. Ooh. You can You can use anything kind of like that. Really? That's amazing. But you're talking about just inexpensive wheat bran totally okay yeah Mm -hmm. and you um add enough of this culture to make it wet enough so it's saturated but when you squeeze it and not not a lot of um water is or liquid is going to come out so that sort of consistency and then i pack it into a container a lidded container um pack it in really strongly and densely so basically you're pushing all of the oxygen all of the air out. Um, cover that with a lid and let that ferment for a couple of weeks. And then it needs to be dried out. 
so I like to make a lot of it in the summer now, um, and I dry it on a tarp. And uh, once that's dried out, it's easy to store in a container in your house, just to keep keep it dry. And then the way that you do Bokashi compost, the simple way method that I use that, that doesn't require any special containers or anything, just a five-gallon pail with a lid, um, I put about four inches of soil, garden soil in the bottom just to absorb any moisture. There are fancy systems where you can, that have little spigots at the bottom where you can drain off. They call it a leachate. Um, and that can be, um, diluted with water and fed to, to plants, but I don't, I don't do that. Um, so the five gallon pail, five inches, four or five inches of soil at the bottom. And then you put in your kitchen waste in about six inches at a time. So you pour it into the bucket, smush it down with a potato masher or a wine bottle. Just You're always pressing all the air out of it. And then sprinkle it with about half a cup of bran, of the inoculated bran. And then you just keep doing that until the bucket's full. Mm-hmm. Every every six inches, you're, it's getting more, more of the inoculated bran. And then um, once it's full, put a lid on it and leave it for two weeks, and it starts to, it should have a nice, like, white mold on the top, Mm -hmm. and it smells kind of pickly, and um, at that point, it's uh, it's ready to put either, some folks put it in trenches in in the garden, and... um, and at that after after that when it's been buried and left for about a month it it's not you can't find very much that hasn't broken down that's amazing and some folks do it in pots but what i do with my bokashi compost is i put it in my worm bin mhm i bet they love that they really love it <laughs> because it's already started to break down like if you put regular kitchen scraps in into uh like fresh kitchen scraps into your worm bin you'll notice that they don't really start to move into it for a few days like it has it has to decompose a little bit before the worms start moving in but with bokashi they just go crazy for it and they they eat it they go through it faster i'm getting such a great visual impression like this is worm dope that's what we're talking about here obviously oh thank you so much for telling us about it i want to hear lots more and i know other people do too you've posted some fabulous stuff on the gabbing about gardening facebook page and i will direct people there can people get in touch with you through the facebook page to learn more for, for sure i'm actually hoping to to um do workshops in the community at some point and uh, and start selling Bokashi brand to to make it easy for for folks to um, do it themselves. So there's lots of exciting things in the works there. There is. Please put me on the list for both the workshop and for some of your Bokashi. I really want to get started doing this, Melissa. Thank you so much for telling us about it. You're welcome. And I look forward to gabbing again about <laughs> compost. I I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Thank you. That's Melissa Ricky, the lady who knows all about Bokashi composting on Cortez Island, and she's going to teach us more about it. Check her out on the Facebook Gabbing About Gardening page. You're listening to Gabbing About Gardening. I'm Lou, and coming up next is Morag Gamble. We'll take a little break here. This is Cortez Radio, CKTZ 89.5. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram. And you can also join our Zoom gathering for gardeners every Monday at 3.30. You can learn more about that on our Facebook page, Gabbing About Gardening. Also, check out cortezradio.ca for upcoming guests and topics on Gabbing About Gardening. Get your toes tapping and body moving with Matt King Kono's Lunchtime Locomotion. Thursdays 11 to 1, grooves exploring round the world upbeat pop, rock, jazz, fusion, and world beat, nostalgia and adventure, spirits lift, with the Lunchtime Locomotion, Thursdays, 11 to 1, here on CKTZ 89.5 FM.
Hello, and welcome back to Gabbing About Gardening. I'm Lou on a beautiful Tuesday afternoon on Cortez Island, and the lady we are going to gab with next is a heroine of mine, Morag Gamble. Morag teaches people all around the world how to garden in a no-dig permaculture style through her permaculture series online. Just go to ourpermaculturelife.com to get started on one of many of Morag's permaculture courses. Morag has also established an amazing organization, Perma Youth. It's an international organization of 11 to 17-year-olds who want to do something positive in the world and think that permaculture is a great way to do this. Welcome, Morag, and thank you for gabbing with us. At, is it 5.30 a.m. your time? Well, it's actually not quite 5.30 yet, Lou. It's nice to speak with you, though. And it's a beautiful excuse to get up this early in the morning. (laughs) Well, uh, we are so grateful that you are making time for us. Tell us about Perma Youth and about the Perma Youth Ambassadors in a Kenya refugee settlement that you've been involved in helping to establish a garden there. Oh, thanks for, thanks for asking, Lou. These young people are just absolutely incredible. I'm, like you said in your introduction, I work with this global group of young people who are interested in exploring how permaculture can not only make a difference in their own lives, but contribute to their community and to creating a, a safe planet that they're growing into. And this this concept is as relevant on Cortez Island as it is here in my eco-village where I live, as it is in, in the refugee settlements. There's, we have now linked with a number of different youth groups all throughout refugee settlements in East Africa. And there's one particular man who we Zoomed in yesterday to... Um, I'm currently at a at an, uh, the Australasian Permaculture Conference, and yesterday... Um, Maya, my 14-year-old daughter, hosted the um, the perma use uh, session, and she set up this Zoom to to bring in the voices of the refugees from East Africa and kids from other places. And what's happening over there is, as he described to the audience yesterday, that permaculture is making a difference in terms of either being hungry or having food to share with the family. Mm -hmm. It's helping to address poverty because they grow food first and then what they have in surplus they can share. It's changing their environment that's making it cooler, shadier, more moist and alive. But more than anything, it's changing how they feel about themselves and their place and their community and that they can do something positive. He said for young people, mostly in places like Kakama Refugee Camp, there's so little to do. So little to do that makes them feel like they're, that they're, you know, what's the point? You know, it's mostly what he says young people ask. Mm-hmm. So this is a point. It's something that they can do to meet their basic needs. It's something they can do to grow food for the widows and the orphans, as he was describing. And also that they, and he's decided um, the best way to ripple this out as far and as wide as he possibly can across this camp, which has several hundred thousand people living in there in this desert camp, is to sing, to sing permaculture. Because he thinks it's something that the young people particularly will resonate with. And so he's, he's created this group called the Permaculture Ambassadors Crew. Young people have gone through permaculture design courses and together have seen the possibilities that this can bring and are now singing it out. Um, and so they've sent, they send a song into the Perma Youth Global Festivals every month, something that's been... Uh, he makes films on his phone. He edits them on the phone as well, takes the, the video. So you get to see life in the refugee camp, the impact that permaculture is, is having. And I'd expected when he first sent one in that it'd be going to, you know, have an African sound to it. It was like full-on hip-hop music influences. It really is. And (laughs) I've posted it on the Facebook page as well. Um, And I listened several times while I was scripting the radio show today. And we're going to be sure that we we play that on one of our future shows. I I just, I love the music that, that they're creating. And 
I mean, you don't really think about youth getting all jazzed and hip hopped about perma youth. Why, why the, <laughs> why this keen interest in, in gardening, especially? I mean, you've outlined why in a refugee settlement it's a, a matter of life and death, but it, does it even surprise you at how it's taken off? Well, well, yes and no. Uh, I've, I've had the absolute pleasure of, being surrounded by young people in an eco village um, for a very long time now, and so I get to see kids who've grown up with a with a with gardening, with permaculture, with nature, and there's a certain sensibility. But the fact that it's spread around the world, we now have perma perma youth Americas hub, there's perma youth um, Philippines, there's perma youth hubs forming in in Europe, in Africa. It's it's taken off because I don't think it's necessarily always about the gardening either, but it's about the connection with young people, with one another, to do something really positive in the world and that there are a variety of ways of expressing that. So some people sing about the importance of local food. Some people take photographs of local food systems. Some people are writing slam poetry about... Uh, these local food systems. So what, what I'm seeing happening here is a, a con, a sort of a congruence of a whole lot of different cultural responses by young people to something that is so positive about their future and something that they can contribute to and express it in a way that is able to be shared with the world and that the world stops and listens. Mm. And I think that they're finding that really empowering. Like many of them were part of, um, you know, different marches in the, before COVID happened with, um, particularly, um, over, over here in Australia anyway, there was the, the, um, the Fridays for Future marches and they would come home and, and they would feel really jazzed, but then go, well, what do we do tomorrow? How do we still continue to have a voice and, and show that we care about the future and, and, and actually act for the future. So that's kind of where it's come from a lot. And what it's turning into, well, is an incredible learning community. So it's not about there being a set curriculum. It's about young people saying, I'm, I'm absolutely, I love my goats. There's this one girl, Eleni. She loves her goats with a passion and she loves bees. And so she... She makes up presentations that she shares with the world of young people about goat husbandry, about how to keep bees and all the facts that she's explored about bees and beekeeping. And, then, and if we don't know something in this young group, they invite someone in to, to talk with them about it. So there's this intergenerational um, education happening, but something that's coming from within the the passions and the questions that are emerging in them. So first they ask themselves, and if they don't know, then they reach out to someone else. And it's also something that's happening, um, you know, like we started off talking, it's, it's cross-cultural. It's, it's, um, it's also like goes beyond class or race or anything. It's mm -hmm. just a completely open, youth-led exploration mm. of what it means to be human in this world today and what it means to be, uh, you know, caring about the future. I love and, it. Um, and, it and means being really to be active human. And, and trying to create something that's not a fearful and anxious filled exactly. uh, future. And what, you know, what you're sharing with us is just pure good news. It must feel so great, especially in these times of, of COVID. And these are already at risk youth because of the challenges that they're facing to be able to be a part of, of nature and to grow up with this, this permaculture attitude. It, it, it must be changing lives dramatically. Mm. Oh, just one last little story. I just got a video. They, they're, particularly in the refugee settlements, they send me videos all the time and I try and post them out through our Ethos Foundation or Perma Youth, uh, Facebook. But what she, what she was saying is that she was standing in the middle of one of their community gardens because we've helped to, to fund them buying 
a piece of land to create a community education garden. And she's standing there. She'd come from another refugee camp to this one to see this garden so she can take it back to hers. And this smile is just creeping across her face. She said, like, there's water running through there. I can hear the sound of birds. And she said, oh, and just the smell is magic. And she's just, you know, she can't contain the happiness. And another refugee was talking about he just spends so much time in their community garden in a, in a different camp because it's a place of peace. And it's a place where he can just just calm down and forget about his worries and just feel connected and feel feel happy. That's beautiful. And I think this is so important. There's something really inherently healing about being in those spaces. And particularly the more vulnerable the community, the more healing possibilities that that it can have. And so this is one of the focuses of Perma mm-hmm. Youth is mm-hmm. the kids in the in the wealthier um, parts of the world are raising funds to support the kids who are in in vulnerable communities. Perfect. So we, That's um, what is supposed to be happening, which leads me to my, my next question, which is how can people get involved and support you? To find out more about Perma Youth, uh, just type in permayouth.org. And this is a youth-run website, and, and currently they've got information about um, the Ambassador Crew music. Uh, they've got a photography competition, and you can subscribe there to their weekly newsletter and get updates about okay. everything that's going on. Good. They also have um, weekly online meetups to connect with other young people around the world doing things, and monthly festivals, uh, online festivals, again, to connect people everywhere, and um, so that's permayouth.org. And what, when the youth raise funds, they send it to um, the charity that I run for to support permaculture projects in many parts of the world. Uh, and that's ethosfoundation.org. So whatever okay. money I collect there, um, and it's mostly for permayouth projects, I have to be honest. Because that well, I know that's, where, your, that's your, your love yeah. and your focus. So that's permayouth.org and ethos.org. Thank you so much, Maura Gamble, for being with us and, and sharing this information with us. You can learn so much more about Morag and all of the fabulous projects that she's spearheading around the world at ourpermaculturelife.com. Morag, I hope you'll be with us again another time. I'd love to. Thanks for having me, Lou. Oh, thank you. And that's it for our first episode of Gabbing About Gardening. This show is produced at CKTZ 89.5 FM, Cortez Radio. Check out Cortez Radio at cortezradio.ca. Now, next week on Gabbing About Gardening, we'll talk to Michael Abelman, author and organic farmer and the founder of Soul Food Street Farms. Michael empowers the urban disenfranchised through gardening by learning to grow their own food. We'll also talk to local soil health gurus who will share their own special tips for building soil fertility. And we'll gab with a few moms who have found some great ways to get the kids into gardening. Gabbing About Gardening also has a weekly Facebook page, or rather a weekly free Zoom gathering for gardeners. And you can find out more about that on our Facebook page, Gabbing About Gardening. And check out our YouTube channel where you'll get to listen to past recordings of our Zoom gatherings, the most recent one with Dr. Nancy Turner. I have a dream, too, and that dream is that you're going to join us next week right here, same time, 1130, same place, Cortez Radio. And thank you, station manager Brian McKinnon, for making this happen. I'm Lucretia Shanfarber. Enjoy the rest of your day. Now, get outside and get dirty. (laughs) 